So my task this morning is to moderate our next session, and I'm absolutely delighted to be joined, obviously, by Tamara Vrooman. Um, the topic before us really is the cooperative economy as a model for BC. And so what I would like to do is start by asking uh, Tamara to comment on um, the meaning of the term cooperative economy, I think we um, often understand it differently. So Tamara, can you share with us a little bit about what the cooperative economy is and how does it relate to or function within what we understand to be the traditional um, private sector market economy? And perhaps if you could comment a bit on the values, the approach and the practices that differentiate it from the mainstream economy. Thanks very much, Janet. I, I thought it was going to be a brief uh, question, but uh, <laughs> I'll try and be brief. And I, I too, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Ed, and uh, and and thank you, Elder George, for the generous welcome uh, for all of us uh, here today. So. Cooperative economics is something, uh, honestly, uh, that was relatively new to me um, as I became the CEO of Van City, a, a community-based financial cooperative. And that's sort of interesting <clears throat> because in my portfolio as a Deputy Minister of Finance, I had at various times responsibility for cooperative uh, and cooperatives in the government, but frankly the policy was not very robust, nor very well understood, nor discussed, pardon me, very much at the provincial level. So the biggest issue uh, with cooperatives in our province is the fact that they're not uh, very well known. So what is what is a cooperative? Well, a cooperative, simply put, is a, is a model of ownership and organization that has uh, generally the people who work in it, who buy goods from it, um, who receive services from it, are also the owners. So in our case, as a credit union, we're owned by the people we serve. Uh, in the case of a producer co-op that you'd see in the dairy industry or in agriculture, producers come together to share infrastructure cooperatively. In the case of a worker co-op, workers come together to create employment for one another to meet a community need. In a service co-op, people come together to provide health care services, support services, child care services, and so on. What makes cooperatives interesting and unique uh, is I think there's a lot of uh, attention paid to the fact that cooperatives are different. They're collectives, they're democratic. But I think what is really interesting about co-ops and what excites me about them, particularly in the modern era, is when we look at some of the companies and businesses in particular that we consider to be those that are the best of the new economy often pointed uh, in the direction of technology or startups or entrepreneurship. They often have at their core collaboration, groups of people together sharing a broader perspective to create and innovate. And at their best, that's what cooperatives do. Because they're a, a group of people that come together in a common bond or mutuality to exchange expertise, to exchange goods, to provide employment, they tend to, first of all, be decision-making models that are far broader than your traditional corporate capital or single owner type of business. Because you have, just like we have in this room, a broader perspective of interests that need to be considered in each and every decision. So cooperatives tend to make better decisions than other kinds of organizations because of the fact that they're required and interested in having a broader uh, perspective and diversity of decision making. They also tend to be very efficient. Because there's no uh, shareholder that's looking to extract a portion of any given transaction or decision that a cooperative makes, they're very efficient. They're able to take the ability of, um, of either the workers or of the producers, and they're able to distribute that both to themselves and to their members in a very direct and efficient way. They're transparent. They have no interest in, uh, in hiding from one another because they are in a common bond coming together to make decisions. They are innovative. They exist only to serve the members' needs of the cooperative, so they're very tied to those needs. 
they tend to generate higher employment uh, because they create employment that's based on the needs of the communities that they serve and they tend to generate higher income and distribution. So the real question is with all of those positives in cooperatives, why don't we see more of them in our society and our economy. And I think that's that's the real challenge for us uh, going forward, because certainly we'll talk a little bit later, but there's examples throughout the world where uh, cooperatives, you know, cooperatives employ about 250 million people around the world. About 12% of the G20 economies are actually uh, cooperatively derived. And the great thing about cooperatives is, on average, they employ uh, more uh, women than they do men, uh, creating uh, more economic activity closer to the ground and closer to the community. That's a fabulous, succinct answer to a very <laughs> complex question, so I thank you for that. Um, can you talk a little bit about what you think is required to actually expand the cooperative economy here in BC? Yeah, I think the first thing, the first thing certainly is education. You know, what it, what is a co-op? Is it a is it something that can only serve a small number of people in a local way? Often when I talk to people about co-ops, they say, oh yeah, yeah, I remember my local co-op. Uh, it was small, it did something that was really important, but it was frankly a, a niche thing. And, and people don't see it as something that can serve some of the broader economic opportunities, business opportunities, or social challenges and environmental challenges that we have. So I think the first thing we need to do is talk more about cooperatives, what they are, what they aren't, who they employ, why they work. Um, the second thing is to profile co-ops more. You know, do, do we know how many co-ops exist in our province? Do, are we aware that some of our largest and most successful entities, either social, environmental, or on the, on the business side, are in fact uh, cooperatives? Do we teach about cooperatives um, in universities and more importantly, um, in uh, in our schools, so I think we have a real awareness um, issue with respect to to cooperatives because certainly, when you look at things as basic as you know recognition for achievement uh, for business results or something like that or awards, most of the things that uh, other corporate forms are recognized for actually are things that cooperatives can do better, stronger, more efficiently, and uh, faster. Right. Well, you know, I think that the cooperative economy couldn't have a better advocate than you, and certainly the work that you've done with Fan City speaks volumes about that. So we all know that there are many big economic and social challenges facing the province, um, technological change, um, the impact on the changing nature of work, growing inequality, cutbacks to the social safety net, all of these things that I know we're talking about uh, during this course of this time together. So can you talk a bit more about the role that organizations like Van City may have to play in addressing some of these? Mm. Yeah, so, so as a member-owned cooperative, as I said, Van City exists for the sole benefit of our members and the communities in which they live and work. And uh, over our history, that has meant that we have um, been at the forefront of addressing issues of inequality and inclusion, you know, whether it was way back in the 60s when we were the first financial institution in the, can in the country to lend to women without requiring a male co-signer, or whether, <laughs> <laughs> or whether uh, more recently the first financial institution and, fin and frankly um, a large private sector business to adopt a living wage, or, or yeah, you can applaud, it's okay. Yes. <laughs> Um, those, uh, or the first one to be uh, carbon, truly carbon neutral. We, um, the, we do those things because um, uh, of the connection we have to our members and because of the advocacy and the permission for advocacy that our members give us uh, each and every day. So some of the things that our members are talking to us about today that we're definitely focused on, but frankly we need broader support than just Van City to really uh, address. Obviously issues of inequality and affordability uh, on the housing side is, is huge. Really um, talking about a uh, lower carbon economy, not only just about leaving 
the harmful stuff in the ground, that alone won't uh, actually get us where mm -hmm. we need to go. But how do we transform the, the work that we are already doing collectively uh, into a more uh, uh, carbon-reduced uh, form? Uh, we certainly talk a lot about inclusion and welcoming newcomers and what are some of the models that we need to put in place. And one of the ones that I'm particularly interested in uh, lately has been the issue of digital inequality, yeah. uh, the digital divide, and digital literacy. You know, we often talk about technology as a great uh, leveler. It's also uh, a, a great generator, potentially, of inequality. And, and, and as we take a look at the fact that, yes, technology is becoming uh, increasingly uh, less expensive, nonetheless, there is an affordability gap. We've done some research that shows that people are foregoing uh, food uh, and the basics of life in order to pay their cell phone bill because they need to get those data plans uh, in place because, frankly, you can't engage as a citizen in our community very easily without access to technology. And what does that look like if we have a young uh, refugee, say, from Syria who's 17 years old, who doesn't have the same access to technology as his longer term settled 17 year old counterpart. What, did, what does that mean in terms of his ability to participate, not only in the education system, but to main, maintain ties back home, learn the language of his new country? The social and economic costs of that are devastating. And then we also see in our own membership, when people, even when people do have access to technology, do they know how to use it? We see the same thing with financial literacy, you know, what's happening with payday lenders and things. We, we understand that people have access to credit, but are they using it in a way that is responsible? Are they being supported to use it in a way that's independent? The same exists with technology. So I think there's really no shortage of things that an open, democratic, community-based corporate form uh, can address, but those are just some of the things that we're thinking about recently. <laughs> You know, uh, your comments about technology are particularly interesting, I think, to me, and also uh, something I've been thinking about a fair bit lately, because, you know, the exponential pace of technological innovation, you know, has two consequences that I think are of great concern. One is the tendency to concentrate more and more wealth in the hands of fewer and fewer people. Mm -hmm. So a good example would be, I think, Instagram was sold for a billion dollars and the profits were shared among 14 staff. So again, that's an extreme example, but clearly Clearly that is the tendency. The second one though is the transformation of work. And I think many of us will be familiar with some recent work done by two, uh, the Oxford Martin School, which predicts that the traditional U.S. economy could lose as much as 47% of traditional jobs in the space of two decades because of computerization, um, artificial, in, uh, th the fact that um, tasks that have traditionally been reserved for humans because they required complex communication and pattern recognition can now be largely computerized. So this in many ways is a positive thing and will open up many new opportunities for creative work, but the pace um, is so great that I think our, our social and our economic institutions aren't really set up to deal with change that's that rapid. Mm. So given that context, how do we actually resist the further bifurcation of, of society? Um, and does the cooperative model have any answers for that? You know, I think that's uh, that's a very interesting question, and you know, the short answer to that is what we really need is a co-op telco in uh, in this country. But the other, <laughs> the maybe other, you'll start one. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> the other uh, the other uh, place to look. You know, there's some very interesting uh, work coming out of. Um, I think personally, I find us unlikely place, uh, but Seoul, South Korea, and so in that particular uh, city. They had a very um, bifurcated, to use that uh, same word, <coughs> economy, where you had, on the one hand, Samsung and everything that in, uh, it, it created, and on the others, very small, very, very small, one and two employee uh, businesses and nothing in the middle. And so the, um, the, the leaders of Seoul became quite concerned that this inequality was going to continue to grow, and in fact, they had no to use the technological term, middleware uh, in their economy, and it was starting to erode the social 
uh, institutions as well. So they did quite a bit of research and work and decided that a cooperative economic model was the way to engage more uh, investment in their community, engage more people in their community, very large community, Seoul, in order to create that bridge um, and start the redistribution of wealth, of literacy, of access, of um, education uh, to a broader group within Seoul. And it's been an interesting experiment to watch. They consulted some of the world's uh, foremost uh, experts on cooperative e economics from the University of Bologna and also from Mondragon in Spain. And it's, it really has, they have started mm -hmm. to develop, as I say, that, that middleware of their economy. They're starting to see the participation rates in cooperatives go up, the literacy rates in terms of understanding what a cooperative is and isn't going up. Innovation is starting to blossom in, in particularly bridging uh, between social issues and economic issues. Uh, they're starting to tackle some of the environmental issues. It ha isn't quite as advanced there. So I think that's an interesting example for us, you know, as we see the two paths diverging at a huge rate, uh, where are there opportunities for us to collaborate in, in a structure that's well understood, uh, well tested, not only in our own community but around the world, uh, in the cooperative economic form? And mm -hmm. I think particularly in areas where the pace of change and the divide is greatest, like mm -hmm. in the areas of technological change, there's a real opportunity for the democratization and increased participation, increased employment, as well as increased uh, generation of income and distribution through the creation of co-ops. Okay, what a fabulous answer, hey? Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna give Tamara one final question, and it's a difficult question, but I think it's also an extremely important one. So having served as a former Deputy Minister of Health, you know all too well the challenges of our fragmented healthcare system mm -hmm. and the difficulties of, of improving it, reforming it in any way. Um, ironically, we may in fact have something to learn from American integrated nonprofit health providers like the Mayo Clinic and Kaiser Permanente. So I'm wondering if you can comment on whether there's a role for the cooperative model in healthcare delivery or possibly education delivery and what that might look like. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly, um, the research uh, shows, and I'm a bit dated on this from my time in health was quite, quite a few years ago, but the research shows that the best health, comes, uh, health outcomes come from practice that is integrated and holistic um, around not just the needs of a patient at a particular point of illness or acuity, but of course, not only across their life, but uh, uh, also understanding the social and economic determinants of health in the communities in which they live. And so the cooperative form in terms of an, an organ, a very efficient organizing mechanism that, that by definition brings broader perspectives together to collaborate and to exchange and to make decisions, I think is very well suited to healthcare. And in fact, when we look at some of the best examples in the primary care field, um, uh, the, the James Bay Clinic uh, comes to mind uh, in Victoria, um, the, uh, the cooperative on uh, Commercial Drive is, is another one. We see that they actually are, they may not actually technically be a co-op, but they're actually organized around that cooperative form and that cooperative model. And so, therefore, there is an opportunity, I think, for greater collaboration. The people I know in uh, uh, practitioners in healthcare are always talking about the, the amount of time that they spend trying to access, chase down some, even say, their colleagues in other parts of the system. Imagine if they're actually just together and making decisions together, <laughs> uh, how much more efficient that would be in terms, of, uh, and also more effective. And one idea that um, I'm starting to uh, be curious about as well, the final point that I think is interesting, is around education. You know, we talk a lot about co-op education, and I myself went on co-ops when I was in university, and so we often talk about cooperative education in that, that sort of internship exchange. But the kind of co-op education that's more interesting to me is what if we created an education cooperative? So what if we had a model that had instructors participating and, uh, and, 
and including their knowledge and labor, students participating in terms of their learning, uh, communities that needed certain educational outcomes, be they First Nations and Aboriginal, be they rural, be they certain kinds of business, um, uh, experts communicated, and they actually created an education cooperative, and the outcomes of that cooperative were broadly defined and democratically held across a broader piece. I think we would have totally different education outcomes and learning opportunities than, uh, than what we have today. Mm -hmm. So that's one that I think uh, I'm personally quite curious mm -hmm. about for the future. Well, wouldn't it be wonderful to, to have some uh, test examples to see whether some of these ideas could be executed, tested, and perhaps brought to scale? So most unfortunately, that brings us to the close of our all too brief uh, conversation. But um, Tamara, I want to thank you for your very content rich, um, I think thoughtful and, and stimulating perspective. You have a huge vision, but I think it's the right vision. And it's inspiring to me, as I know it is to all of us, to see how effective you and Van City have been in manifesting the values that you espouse in the work that you do on a day-to-day -day basis. So I want us all to thank, thank uh, Tamara very generously very for joining thank us, you. but also for her leadership.